Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Shifting Gears. My name's Grayson Harris. That is Whitney Cowell over hey. there. And uh, welcome to a little bit of a new setup here. We uh, we upgraded. We moved next door, and it now looks like we actually do a show. When was the last time that you were on a cruise? I think 2004 or 2005. It's oh, been a while. Wow. Okay. So the last one that I was on was in 2019. That was actually the last vacation I've taken at all. Obviously, in 2020, of all the industries that took a hit because of the pandemic, the cruise ships to me are the most obvious. Uh, it's the only industry I can think of that legitimately just fell off the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. Speaking of which, actually, do you remember a lot of the cruise ships that were like stranded at sea during that first like month or two of the pandemic oh, when yeah. we didn't know what was going on? The cruise ship industry itself, I mean, it completely shut down by March of 2020, leaving many to wonder whether or not it would even recover ever. I remember actually having the thought, are cruise ships even going to exist after this? Yeah. Or if so, to what capacity? But eventually, as the world began to open back up, up. Yeah, cruise ships came back uh, with no issue whatsoever, almost like they never went away. They just took a little two-year hiatus. Um, so today, the industry is looking healthy as ever. Bigger, more complex ships seemingly coming out all the time. Which is crazy yep. because it's a floating city. Oh my goodness. You have no idea. <laughs> and They're huge. Um, but as these ships get larger and more complicated, the logistics behind making sure that they run smoothly, that's also going to get larger and more complicated. Um, as you guys know, we like to go behind the scenes of stuff like this that you don't usually consider and kind of give you a bit of a different perspective on what it's going to be. Um, and let me tell you, the behind the scenes of a cruise ship is quite literally like watching the behind the scenes of a small town yeah. that gets repopulated every seven days. <laughs> Just to give you guys some context, we're going to go through a quick history lesson here okay. to give you some, give you an idea of how the cruise ship industry began and how these vessels turned into floating continents. Cruise ships as we know them today, they're focused on relaxation and entertainment, mm -hmm. but their predecessors, ocean liners, they were built exclusively for travel across the world's oceans. They're basically big floating buses. Before airplanes could make the journey across the oceans like the Atlantic, ocean liners were really the only way to do it. It. But because these trips were, you know, long, unpleasant trips, you were stuck on a ship going across the ocean for, mm -hmm. you know, a long time. The advertisers of these ocean liners started presenting them as though they were hotels at sea, aimed to basically make people forget that they're on a ship. Mm -hmm. uh, as airplanes began to replace ocean liners as a preferred method of travel across the oceans, uh, the ocean liners themselves had to change their business model if they were going to survive. If they couldn't beat the speed and the efficiency of flying, well, the next best thing that they could do was offer something else entirely, which was luxury and comfort. Make it fun. Make it expensive. <laughs> now that ocean liners had identified a new business model, they still had to solve a new problem that they had, which would be the size and the design of their ships. Ocean liners, well, they weren't really designed to be cruise ships, right? right? They were meant to get their passengers across the oceans as fast and as comfortable as they possibly could. Uh, they sat very low in the water to make it through the rough ocean waves, but this meant that they could only dock at the deep water ports. Mm -hmm. And um, well, there's not as many deep water ports uh, as you would need to run an industry like this, not even close to enough actually. So basically the design that made them good for international travel made them poor candidates for a relaxing, slow cruise in more of the shallow, calmer waters of, for example, the Caribbean. Uh, but by the 1970s, ocean travel was pretty much on its last legs. Uh, the largest ocean liner in the world, the SS France, couldn't sell enough tickets, so they were actually forced to just sit idle for years. I think it was upwards of four or five years just sitting, doing nothing until it was purchased by the Norwegian Caribbean Lines and it was converted into a full-time cruise ship. It no longer needed to be fast, so they took out one of the engines, took out some of the propellers. Sure. Um, to gain access to the shallow water ports, they installed uh, tenders, which are basically just little ferry boats uh, that they use to transport passengers from the ship to the port and back again. One more thing that they did is they removed the barriers between the class sections so that the passengers could move freely around the ship uh, you know, before then, as Titanic made very popular, all the levels were divided into classes. Mm -hmm. First class up top, lower classes on the bottom. They took that out completely um, and just basically turned all that space into bars and restaurants and entertainment options. Uh, the ship was renamed to the SS Norway, so it just changed its citizenship from France to Norway. <laughs> and uh, it debuted in June of 1980. 
So the big difference between the SS Norway and other ships was that the SS Norway was advertised as a destination, not just a travel option. So it made far less stops than other uh, smaller cruise vessels. Mm -hmm. uh, the success of the Norway prompted an arms race to create bigger and better ships to fit more passengers, more entertainment options, more amenities, more restaurants, and so on. Uh, there's a graph that I'll put up on the screen here in a little bit where you can see um, by year what kind of ships are being made. And you can see from 1980 up until now, the line just goes straight yeah. up to way heavier and it happens fast. Like there's, you know, from 1980 to 1990, like just a decade passed and basically the Norway was like totally obsolete by the, by the time that they had gotten all that stuff together. This also meant though that the design of ships was gonna be forever changed as well. Uh, this meant that prominent features of old ocean liners like the tall smokestacks, and the long bow had been replaced by literally anything that the cruise ship companies could cram on there to yeah. take as much money as they possibly can or to fit as many passengers as they possibly can. So you can't go up to the bow of the ship like in Titanic and do the whole king of the world thing or top of the world, whatever, because there's no room. <laughs> like it's, it's a pool now. Yeah. You know, so you can't really do any of that. A salty pool at that. Yeah, a salty pool. The smokestacks are usually surrounded by like water slides and stuff, so you can't <laughs> even see it. So by the time that it debuted in the 1980s in Norway, it was actually the largest passenger vessel in the world, but today's ships make it look like a little tugboat by comparison. Uh, the Norway had an internal volume of 70,000 tons. Today, Royal Caribbean alone has five ships with an internal volume of over 220,000 tons each. Jeez. Yeah, five ships with an internal volume of over 220,000 tons each. That is wild. Um, in 2024, next year, Royal Caribbean's newest vessel, the Icon of the Seas, will set the new record with an internal volume of 250,000 tons. That is a quarter of a million tons just floating. So uh, to give you a little bit more context here, in 1980, there was basically one cruise ship the way that we know it today, mm -hmm. and a declining but still significant fleet of ocean liners around the world. Today, there are over 320 cruise ships, and there is one ocean liner that is still in service, the Queen Mary II. Uh, it's been in service since uh, 2004, so almost two decades. It was christened by Queen Elizabeth II. And it still travels uh, from Southampton to New York City as basically the last remnant of a totally bygone time where ships didn't need to have casinos. And now they all do. It's interesting that when cruise ships or the ocean liners, when they phase out, mm -hmm. they're so massive that you can't really have a museum dedicated to the history of them without having yeah. bits and pieces of one the ship available would be the museum. to see. Right. They would have to be the entire thing. There, yeah. There is a battleship in Alabama where I'm from yeah, that okay. I went to a lot growing up. And so I'm wondering if when they retire mm -hmm. this, this ship, if they will use it for a similar purpose. Well, that's an interesting question. I have some information regarding what happens to cruise ships when everything gets shut down and what oh, they do with them. Sad. I don't <laughs> I do not have information on what exactly happens to retired cruise ships because there are very few re retired cruise ships. I mean, the Carnival Ecstasy, which is actually a ship I've been on, uh, is the Carnival's oldest ship and it was made in like 1991 or something like that. So, yeah, I mean, they they can keep ships for 30 plus years and most cruise ships aren't going to be much older than 30 plus years. Mm -hmm. They're all pretty much still in use. So that being said, then how are the largest cruise ships in the world able to prepare and serve thousands, thousands. of people? Yeah, it, it's insane. The logistics behind some of these extremely large ships. Um, Royal Caribbean has the largest ships in, in the, mm -hmm. in the entire world. Um, and they're, you know, obviously about to make uh, history by making an even bigger one. But currently, uh, Royal Caribbean's Symphony of the Seas is actually the largest cruise ship in the world right now. Um, it can accommodate 5,518 passengers at double occupancy, up to a maximum capacity of 6,680 passengers, as well as 2,200 uh, crew members. There are 16 decks, 40 restaurants and bars, 40, 40 restaurants. restaurants and bars. Yes, that is including like the drink stations at the pools. Kind of cheating. Not really, though. That's a lot. Uh, seven neighborhoods. It's split into neighborhoods. <laughs> uh, just to, to further emphasize the fact that it is a city with its own boroughs. 
Uh, there's 23 pools and water slides. There are 2,759 cabins, and it's also five times larger than the Titanic, weighing in at 228,081 gross tons. Big boy. Thick ship. <laughs> Thick with two Cs. So obviously, uh, planning and the logistics behind that... <laughs> It's going to take months, if not years, to make sure that everything runs smoothly, mm -hmm. uh, but nothing oh, yeah. can prevent the insanity that is turnaround days. Oh, I cannot imagine. Turnaround days are pretty much exactly what they sound like. It refers to the days when one group of guests leaves and another one boards. This is when most of the supplies, fuel, and all that good stuff is changed out. Uh, during this, this is usually a 10 to 12 hour period. Um, and during this time, deck zero is closed off to all the passengers and it's essentially turned into a highway. Some of the crew members nickname it like the Autobahn, where it's just uh, people darting in and out with supplies and just chaos to prepare for the next um the next crew or the next um, batch of passengers to come in. And what makes this unique also is that these turnaround days are very strict. They have a very strict time schedule that they have to adhere to. Oh, they would have to. Absolutely. Yeah. So there is obviously, you know, working with the suppliers to make sure that they're, they are there where they need to be at a certain mm -hmm. time, that they have exactly uh, what they need to make it through, you know, what is typically a seven day cruise. Uh, the average rotation involves switching out crew members, restocking various supplies, disposing of waste, refueling, everything that you can possibly think of. And obviously that's going to create congestion in the port with other vessels as well. So, yeah. you know, it's um, whenever a cruise ship is in town, you know, for sure. Uh, but as they continue to grow in size, well, so too does the amount of supplies and the ingredients needed just to keep it running. Um, even the smallest cruise ships consume 5,000 eggs and 4,000 cups of tea per week. Uh, that's a lot of breakfast. Oh, the food on a cruise ship is so hard to beat, though. That is the best part of a cruise ship. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And if we want to get more specific, the actual best part is the ice cream machine. Is it? I have gotten my money's worth out of an ice cream machine. <laughs> like, oh, goodness gracious. I really have. But by comparison, though, that's, that's for the smaller cruise ships, mm -hmm. right? The Symphony of the Seas, that one requires 60,000 eggs, 9,700 pounds of chicken, 20,000 pounds of potatoes, and 700 pounds of that sweet, sweet ice cream every single week every 24 hours the ship consumes 479,314 gallons of fresh water yes that's a real number and it carries 195 bottles of liquor 440 cases of champagne just everything you can possibly think of all the ingredients required to serve guests at 14 different restaurants and that serve over 350 different dishes i feel like that is a low number of liquor bottles i agree i don't know why that stands out to me like the liquor bottles compared to the amount of ice cream <laughs> priorities <laughs> I mean, those are the priorities that I would choose, sure. but no, they're spending plenty of money on those yeah, eggs. Yeah, no, but the drink package, I think, takes care of that. I mean, these cruise ship companies are making hundreds of dollars of profit per passenger. Mm -hmm. So money never really mattered to them. I just got to be totally honest with you. Um, until it, until they didn't make any. Well, that's how it happens. <laughs> yeah. How do they get all these ingredients? Well, at its, you know, for again, we're talking about the Symphony of the Seas here, just for mm -hmm. reference. Uh, while it's at its home port in Miami, it can go through a pretty hectic turnaround day, which can last well over eight hours, probably longer than that, honestly. I think that's a pretty... Um, it seems like a short time frame for yeah, the cruise ship. Yeah, a little bit. It seems a bit ambitious. Um, so provision plans are communicated to suppliers well ahead of time so that they're ready to go by the time that they arrive. Um, what's interesting about all this is that all of the crew is on hand for this. There's not like a specific like loading and unloading crew. Yeah. Like you'll see like the cruise ship, you know, entertainment host down there, like hoisting uh, barrels of whatever, just because everyone's pretty much, you know, all hands on deck. Chefs are very hands on during this process as well. They literally go through and open all the boxes and taste the ingredients to ensure that everything is fresh and of the highest quality. So. Just keep that in mind that there's definitely a chef down there just picking through the strawberries just to make sure everything's all right. Keeps the vendors on their toes, I'm sure. <laughs> Loading can require more than 100 people. It includes store managers, restaurant operators, and like I said earlier, even some of the entertainment hosts. Mm -hmm. uh, no one is absolved of this duty. During these turnaround days, we're talking about over 300 tons of food, beverages, and ingredients getting loaded onto the ship. 
Um, those things usually get loaded into one of the 20 massive storerooms that they have around the ship. And then also every six hours, those storerooms are getting checked for yeah. temperature and, and any changes like that. Uh, Royal Caribbean, they've got 25 ships located around the world. So the planning is going to be much different depending on the ship and also where the ship is based out of. Uh, menus are going to be specifically tailored to the ship's home port and also the destinations. Yeah, uh, I think that's really cool they do it that way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and which it's not even really all that difficult for them to do it because they hire so many different crew of different nationalities. Mm-hmm. Um, there's almost nothing you can think of that they can't take care of. Right. It's all it's all pretty much all encompassed there. Each ship is usually loaded with two days of extra food in case it gets stranded, <laughs> you know, due to bad weather. Sure. Uh, or in the case of 2020, um, they need it just in case a ship gets stuck in the middle of the ocean. That would be so hard to explain to your boss. Sorry, I got stuck on a cruise ship in the middle I, of the ocean. I have a, I have a note. Uh, it's called ABC News. They <laughs> flew a helicopter over the ship. So that's the logistics of loading up a cruise ship and getting it ready for you know one of its normal trips. But what's far more fascinating, at least in my eyes, was the logistics of shutting it all down. Because that had never been done before. Diamond Princess itself, they had an outbreak on board, and it was quarantined at uh, Yokohama for basically the entire month of yep. February. Of the 3,711 people on board, around 700 became infected, and another nine people died. So that was a pretty big wake-up call, like, oh, yeah. here we go. I yeah. remember reading about that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Very briefly after that, most cruise ships voluntarily decided to end yep. uh, services. Um, but then you know the CDC came out and made it official in early March and said... All right, for 30 days, no one can get on a cruise. Uh, we're shutting down the whole thing. But cruise ships are not like other businesses where, you know, if you're forced to shut down or cease operations and, you know, there's, a, there's ways around it, you know, there's yep. ways to survive. But think about this, you know, once all the passengers were safely unloaded, you still had thousands of crew members that are just remaining on board with nowhere to go, just right. sitting there. Uh, for the first 30 days of the shutdown, cruise ships actually kept all of their crew on board, hoping they could just wait it out until the world opened back up. Do you remember how naive we all were? We were like, oh, this will be over by well, April. Everybody thought, you know, okay, I'll quarantine for yeah. two weeks and then, um, and then it'll be everything fine. will be fine. And, yeah. But nope. they're not the only person on the planet, so that's that's not <laughs> how infections work. Yeah, not, <laughs> not, not quite. Uh, so we'll, when the CDC extended their no sale order for another 100 days, well, mm-hmm. now the cruise industry has got a very big problem yeah. on their hands. What are they going to do with nearly 40,000 crew members that are scattered around the globe? Well, here's what they decided to do. Or here's what Carnival decided to do. I think they handled this better than mm-hmm. most of the other ones. Um, which makes sense because they make quite a bit more money, like triple what any other yeah, they do. cruise ship company makes. They're insane. <laughs> um, so although they did eventually have to let go of most of their staff, Carnival Cruise Lines took on the incredible challenge of getting their almost 26,000 crew members back to their home countries by utilizing their own fleet. If you've got the ships, might as well use them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Finding flights for 26,000 people, even without a pandemic, would be extremely difficult. This is why they decided, let's use our ships right. instead, it makes obviously. Sense. Uh, in late April, Carnival chose to recall 18 of their 23 ships to a spot off the coast of Grand Bahama Island. Some 10,000 members were shuffled between the ships that were designated for certain regions of the world. Uh, for example, crew from Asia boarded the Carnival Conquest, uh, the Eastern European crew members boarded the Carnival Magic, and so on. Uh, In May, seven ships carrying over 26,000 crew members left the Grand Bahamut Island, bound for destinations like Great Britain, India, South Africa, Philippines, Mm -hmm. pretty much anywhere all over the world. By the end of it, some of the crew spent over two months at sea, um, just literally locked inside of this floating city for two months uh, as a result of all this. I hope they queued up some good movies for that. Chewy, yeah, hopefully... Yeah, a lot of good movies, hopefully a lot of Jimmy Buffett. The pandemic was obviously devastating to the cruise industry for a lot of reasons, a lot of unique reasons, I would say. Uh, in the third quarter of 2019, the three largest cruise lines were bringing in billions in revenue, right? But in the same quarter of 2020, they were only bringing in maybe a few million with Royal Caribbean somehow losing $33 million, which is yikes! totally unheard of for a company that brings in billions of revenue, not only to not bring in billions, but to lose, lose millions? That much. That's pretty insane. Um, obviously, most of the crew and onshore staff had to get let go, but 
well, what are you going to do with the ships? You can't fire a ship. Mm-hmm. You know, you can't just tell it to go home. Um, they've got to be stored somewhere. And storing it in a port is expensive. And also, there's not enough room for the right. ports. Um, the world's cruise ship ports, they weren't built with a global pandemic in mind. So there was simply not enough room to store every cruise ship in the world in a port. So the vast majority of the world's cruise ships were forced to, to basically just stay out at sea, huddled into little cruise ship pods. Which uh, probably looked so funny. It, from it an does. I've watched view. some of the video. It looks hilarious. <laughs> it looks like there's a. It looks like one of those giant like boat lake parties where they everybody just ties together. Everybody <laughs> ties together, but we're talking but we're talking huge cruise ships instead. Yeah, yeah. So the vast majority of the world's cruise ships were forced to stay out at sea, huddled into groups. The only exception being, uh, you know, they'll send one of the ships, like a courier ship, basically, mm-hmm. to go to the, the one of their home ports, and they'll pick up food, mail, and other crew members drop off some other crew members and then they come back and distribute it go amongst pick up the everybody mail. go pick up the mail the cruise mail which i thought was hilarious they described it as mail and i was like okay <laughs> you just go to pick up <laughs> the bills so unfortunately though you can't just park a cruise ship in the middle of the ocean and no. then come back and fire it up and hope nope. that it's all going to be good uh, they have to be sta- uh, staffed and maintained 24 hours a day mm-hmm. in order to remain operational so they, um, they kept just enough crew to perform the basic functions, um, but, you know, everything they're doing costs money, and they're literally not bringing in any money right. at all. But thankfully for them, by 2021, the industry was starting to kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, there were over 13 million cruise passengers in 2021, which is nearly double the amount in 2020, but still about 53% lower than in 2019. So we're seeing the improvement, but we're not back yet. But by last year, in 2022, most of the world's cruise ship fleet have returned to action. At least 93% of the pre-pandemic original fleet around the world had returned to action in some capacity or another. And by the end of this year, in 2020, it's estimated that there's going to be over 31 million people traveling on cruise ships. That number could reach 40 million by 2027. So I'd say it's pretty much safe to say that uh, cruise ships are back. Bouncing back. They're bouncing back. And... You know, uh, now they have to deal with the new logistical issue of dealing with the new largest ship in the world next year. So all of those numbers that I just read you are going to be out of date next year as yeah. um, as the Symphony of the Seas gets replaced uh, by that behemoth that is coming yeah. next year. Which so. I'm curious to see to know when production started, because one of the things I was looking up is, you know, the time frame that it takes to actually build a cruise ship. By two weeks, right? Usually 12 to 18 months, but they can take up to three years. The Royal Caribbean Wonder of the Seas took three years to build. Yeah. And one of the things I thought was really interesting, just a fun moment, especially if we're going to see the the production of more newer cruise ships is this thing called the ceremonial cutting um, of steel. And so it's the first cut of steel for the cruise ship, and they bring the owner of the ship in to watch it happen, which I think was, uh, oh, wow. I think that would be such a magical moment. And then yeah. there's also like the handoff ceremony where they do something really specific for that too. <laughs> Here's your boat. But they have to travel for that because from my understanding in my research, there's only four shipyards, major shipyards in the entire world that can house the production of a cruise ship because of how much space it takes up to make a floating city. Yeah, that's an understatement. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so I, I found myself kind of diving into a little bit of the, the darker history of cruise ships and I will spare some of the gory details. Warning, we're about to get dark. Yeah. Well, it's basically how many have sank because a lot of people know about the Titanic. That was the, one of the most notable ones. Right. I mean, there was a four hour movie made about it. Oh, that one. More cruise ships have sank than than I thought. So I want to ask you how, how many, many think? you think in the last 100 years have sank. So this is including ocean liners then? Um, if it's 100 years, it has to. It should include okay. ocean liners, yeah. Man, I'm going to assume that most of these happened in the early years. And there's going to be a little bit of a tapering off on the graph here. So I'm going to, in the last 100 years, I'm going to put it at 250. 50. Cruise ship sinking? <laughs> Goodness gracious, no. I was the same thing. 
Two hundred. I'm, I'm including ocean liners. Twenty-two. Oh, okay. Whoops. I, I played the game wrong. We'll start this over. You know, I'm gonna guess. Um, I don't know, like seven. Is it? Way is closer. it seven? No, it's twenty-two. Oh. Oh, rats. <laughs> and one of the ones that I found was really interesting. It was a Chinese cruise ship. It sank um, from a storm. It capsized in the ocean from a storm. That's terrifying. And that isn't that so scary because a, the stability of the ship is very well tested before it launches. It's like hitting turbulence but B, in the water. But B, the size of that storm that must have happened yeah. and to be a passenger on that, because this isn't like we've hit a rock, something happened aboard. This is being on the ship yeah. during that, which means you're getting jostled around. Absolutely terrifying. That was in 2015. And the most recent ship to sink was in what year, Grayson? 2020. 2020. <laughs> <laughs> it was the Orient Queen. Um, and that one sank because of an ammonium nitrate explosion on board. Oh, my goodness. Yes. <laughs> So, okay. <laughs> um, that one thankfully did not have passengers aboard. Unfortunately, the one in 2015 did have passengers aboard. Oh. That was a that was a pretty large ship if you go look at it. Yeah. Um, so I hope that some of these newer ones that are being made, that are being produced as we're continuing to improve technology, yeah. we can minimize some of that. I, the number wasn't as big as I thought it would be, but I mean, think of finding that many cruise ships at the bottom of the ocean yeah uh, part of me thinks that some of the largest cruise ships now and i know i'm echoing whoever it was that built the titanic when i say it's unsinkable but they're almost too big to sink I, i'll take it back they're too big to sink fast enough to be an issue i feel like it's going to take two to three business days for one of these giant <laughs> ships to take on enough water to actually sink. Mm -hmm. Something about it just feels like it's, once you get into it being that big, it's like sinking into quicksand. And I'm totally making this up. There's gonna be some ship engineer who's absolutely face palming right now, wondering why I'm such an idiot. Um, but I did it so that you'd comment and tell me that I'm an idiot. So who really wins? I do. But I also don't want to test that theory. Um, yeah. I'd rather I'd rather see maybe some simulations <laughs> just to kind of yeah. see if I'm correct in that regard. But I um, I would hope that if you're building the world's largest cruise ship, you uh, have some uh, some redundancies built in. Yeah. Hopefully. Hopefully. That's. But you know, I'm sure the passengers of that really unpopular ship that sunk. Um, probably thought that too. Yep. Yeah. Not to end this on a negative note, but I just thought those numbers were really interesting. Well, guys, go go get on a boat, and you might not sink. Take a trip. Uh, chances are you won't. There's a low chance that you will sink. It was like one in eighty six thousand yeah. chance, or something like that. Yeah. I read. So, like you know, sinking on a cruise ship. You know, the chances of sinking on a cruise ship are pretty low, but they're never zero. I think that is greater than getting struck by lightning, though. So there's that statistic. If you got struck by lightning on a cruise ship, you'd be like the most unlikely man in the world. You'd make national news, though. You'd pro probably. <laughs> anyway. anyway, guys, thank you for joining us. Um, let us know if you've got any funny cruise story ships. Uh, cruise story ships. Sure. Let us know if you have any. <laughs> yeah, let us know if you have any funny uh, cruise ship memories or stories or anything like that, that you want to share. We will see you guys next time.